clerical training and review session. And thank you for being here. I also want to make sure I thank you for all the work that you've been doing in your regions and your health units in regards to COVID. I know it's been a stressful few months. <clears throat> As we move back to some services, some regions have moved back sooner than others, but a lot of you have plans to resume services upcoming. We wanted to refresh um, some key concepts, but we also wanted to introduce a couple of new things that, ha you know, that have been challenging with our Intergy system. Our core operations and program group has developed this presentation to kind of go over those things with you. Those of you that are on the EMR Super Users Workgroup would have received an email, and for the rest of you, I do want to let you know that you, each region has one to three super users for clerical in your region. Uh, we will go over communication workflow, but just so you know, these folks are going to be your go-to people. We are looking for a co-chair. Uh, Tamara Hewitt has been gracious enough to continue in that role until we do select a new one. So if you're interested in knowing more about being co-chair for this uh, EMR users work group, please let me know. We definitely want to have your um, input and feedback, and we want to have someone from the region participate as, as co-chair. I want to remind you that this recording, um, that this presentation is being recorded and that the recording will be uploaded to Moodle. We are going to go over some key points to Moodle that will be expanded to allow for more programs to have their information and their materials on Moodle so that you can easily find it. And we are going to strongly encourage you to save that website so that you can easily find the most up-to-date um, documents <clears throat> for any questions that you might have. And with that, I will turn it over to one of our many co-hosts that have helped put this together, uh, Daniela Wilson from the Bureau of Health Informatics. Hey guys, good afternoon. As Deborah said, I'm Daniela Wilson for those that haven't met. I'm the Clinical Systems Support Manager in Health Informatics. So everything we're covering in this training was identified as an opportunity for improvement in some way. So our, our objectives for this training are to demonstrate the how-tos and learn why each is important for. Um, it's going to be to learn or refresh on how to navigate Moodle, complete all required trainings in Moodle, and view available resources. We are going to talk about how training compliance is monitored, including the roles and responsibilities of the user, the supervisors, and regional leadership. We're going to learn how to properly schedule appointments, how to maintain and clean up the schedules. We're going to learn which patient demographic fields are required and how to navigate those fields. We're going to learn how to check insurance-based plans, and we're going to also learn how to check eligibility for each patient. We're going to learn the clerical role in voiding encounters. We're also going to learn how to correctly post lab charges and how to check on pending charges. And finally, we're going to give you guys some additional training resources and tell you how to get help when you need it. All right. Now we're um, going to change over to Tammy with Moodle. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and play a pre-recorded video and then I'll be available for questions after the video plays. Hello and welcome to today's Moodle presentation. Moodle is used for Title X requirements, also for telemedicine, and now for EHR clinical and clerical modules, among other things that Bureau of Family Health uses as well. Some of you may be asking, what exactly is Moodle? Moodle is a learning management platform that's designed to provide educators, administrators, and learners with a single, robust, secure, and integrated system to create a learning environment. Bureau of Family Health is the one program that manages and updates Moodle. The web address is www.bfhtraining.ldh.la.gov. It's recommended that each person bookmark it for easy access to Moodle and to the learning materials. How does anybody um, get access 
or a username and a password to Moodle. So when someone is hired in the regional leadership, one of the regional leadership team will complete the link right here below on REDCap, which will automatically be routed to the proper person to add that participant or, or staff member. Whenever that is done, then each participant, depending on their role in the organization, is going to be assigned to a cohort. And cohorts are just a fancy word for saying it's a course category group. For instance, if their role in the organization is a clinical staff person, they're going to be put into the clinical staff cohort. If their role is clerical, they're going to be put into the clerical staff cohort, and so on. Each module is created and we enroll participants based on their role in the agency. So we'll automatically assign everybody in a certain cohort for that module. That way we, we don't have to enroll individual people as long as they're in the appropriate cohort. The first thing that you'll that the participant will do is they will log in using that that web address and we will email their login information along with a temporary password. One of the first things they need to do is they when they lo they log in using that temporary password is to go and change it to something that they will remember. And here are the instructions for how to do that. Once you log in, you'll see the top dashboard and you'll see their name here. You click on this top right blue icon, which will drop down their preferences and they can change their password. We mentioned the top header, and on the top header, once they click My Dashboard, it will come up with the modules that, the, that their cohort has been assigned to. If they don't see the module they're looking for, look at the bottom and make sure they don't have hidden courses. If they say that they have courses that are hidden, click beside there, say show all courses, and then all of them will be visible in that one dashboard. When you go into your dashboard, each participant will need to click on each individual module to see what are the requirements for completion of that module. Some modules require that a file is uploaded as for instance, proof that you completed it or um, the certificate of completion after you complete something online. And that will have a file submission area here. You can tell that you have uploaded the file and it's done whenever you see that file submission. If you see it like this, where it just has a blank space beside file submission, then you can tell there's no PDF file and you have not submitted. Like I said earlier, this is the this is like a sample for um, one of the courses that we have for clinical staff. And when you click in it, it'll tell you exactly what to do to complete this course. Click on it, go through it, and then upload your file here. After you upload your file, you'll click Save Changes, and that will save and mark it as complete. Some of the courses do not require a file submission. For example, we've already submitted the file for you as a reference for you to look back at and to attest that you have looked at it and that you um, understand and agree to follow this information. This serves as an attestation statement. So when you open this file and you review it, if you do not understand the material, you need to reach out to your supervisor for full clarification before you check the box. After you gain clarification from your supervisor, you will then open the file read and check the box here. Once this box is checked, that means that you have attested that you are going to understand and agree to follow whatever information is contained therein. If there is a box, that means that it is not complete unless you open the document, read it, and check the box that you've attested. For some videos, some videos we do live. 
and you may be a participant in a live video. But we don't take um, a roll call. We don't know who is actually online doing that video. So we will upload it to Moodle. And when we upload it, if you have viewed it live, you'll go in, you'll click open the video. You don't have to watch it in its, in its entirety unless you want to watch it again. You can click off and click the button. But if for whatever reason you were on vacation or out that day or working clinic and did not have an opportunity to view the video, at that point you'll click into the video, watch the video, and then click that you have checked uh, and you attest that you have watched it. We will be pulling Moodle reports for all of the different modules. Those reports will be pulled, generated, and sent to central leadership. Central leadership will then forward them to regional leaderships in which the regional leaderships can help work with all the staff to ensure timely compliance with the modules. Here again is the live version for the demo. You can see where this address is the bfhtraining.ldh.la.gov. Click enter and it will take you to this page. Key in your username and your temporary password, which is given to you in an email from the program. Then you click login. If for whatever reason you forget your username and password, you can click here and you will be able to retrieve either one. Once you log in for the first time, you want to go over to the um, blue icon with your name and you're going to click Preferences, and then you're going to click Change Password. Change it to something that you will remember. This is your top ribbon. Go to My Dashboard, and these are all of the modules that you have been assigned depending on your role in the agency. Remember to scroll all the way to the bottom to show all courses. There may be some courses hidden that you're not seeing and you think you've done them all and they're really just at the very bottom. I'm going to go into the EHR clerical module and show you what that looks like. The first thing you're going to see is a welcome, then any announcements that may be there, and each one of these is going to have a check box. So once you view the website, see what is on SharePoint, you will click that you viewed it. Once you read the user guide and you attest that you have read and understand and agree to follow any of the information therein, you check the box and continue to do this all the way down. There's your FAQs. Here's some clerical trainings that maybe if you missed, you can tell that I've already opened this and mark this box complete. There's also going to be tip sheets. If you have missed any kind of infographics that might be helpful, you can click in here and you can see the infographic and print it off if you would like. Hit the back button to go back to your module and you can click this that you've done this. Okay, I'm going to go into Title 10 Orientation and show you how to drag and drop a file. Click in the module. Here is where it is going to tell you exactly how to complete the requirements for the module. I have already printed my checklist and signed and I've scanned it back in my computer. I'm going to edit this submission, click it, and I'm going to delete that out so I can show you how to re-upload. I'm going to save those changes. Now it's, now it's gone. Now I'm going to open my file explorer. And the easiest thing is to find that file and just drag it over into this box and hit save. And now you can see that you have that file. Another way that you can add the file if you do not want to drag and drop is to click add, 
go to Upload a File, Choose File, and this is where you're going to choose where is that file that you want. So you find the file that you want to um, download, click it, and hit Open, and then upload this file. And same thing, after you upload it, make sure you hit Save Changes. Now that module is complete. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about our appointments that are currently on the schedule and the scheduling that we are doing now. Um, right now, with the ever-changing landscape due to COVID, we are asking that you look at your scheduled appointments two weeks out. If you could review your schedules for two weeks going forward, verifying um, various information that we will discuss here, that would be very helpful. And of course, being aware that things will continue to change. That is the only constant right now. So um, we're talking about reviewing schedules for two weeks. Um, one of the things we need to do is check appointment types. And as I said, things are always changing. My first statement here is only telehealth appointments on the schedule for APRNs. That is changing. They are now beginning to schedule some procedures for APRNs at the flagship. So you will still have mainly telehealth appointments on those schedules for now, but they are beginning to see in-person procedures at some health units. So I wanted to make that clarification. Any patients you have on the schedule that um, are in left over with a non-telehealth appointment, you should still be contacting them to see if they wish to be converted to a telehealth appointment, if it's something that they can do via telehealth. And if they need to be seen in person, they can be put on the wait list. TB medical clinics are scheduling in-person visits. TB nurses are seeing patients in person for active medication problem cases and reviews. Latent TB case patients are being done um, monthly reviews by phone at this time. Uh, Children's Services is having both in-person and telehealth visits based on the type of service and clinic they are holding. Um, we have uploaded to Moodle the schedules for the CYCHCN clinics and social workers and nutritionist visits, and that uh, schedule is available to you in Moodle. You can check to see which ones are on the telehealth schedule and which are doing in-person visits. Currently, nurses are seeing immunization and WIC patients in the clinics. For your telehealth appointments, we are asking that you please continue to verify that if it is a telehealth appointment, it is serviced at a telehealth location. Your telehealth locations all begin with the code letter T. For um, this example here, you see this is a telehealth visit. We want to ensure that the location is a T code. It's telehealth CADO in this case. So you need to verify when you are reviewing your schedules and your appointments that any of the telehealth patients are scheduled at the telehealth locations. Another thing we're going to ask you to start doing is verifying the contact method um, for all the patients that are on your schedules. Um, currently, we would like you to set all of those to do not contact. Um, you may be aware that a new uh, consent for services has been sent out, and that is going to allow you to start collecting this information as to whether um, they want to uh, select either email, a text, or voicemail to be able to be contacted for messaging. But at the current time, since those have just been um, put out, we want you to set everyone to do not contact. We do not want to be send mess sending messages to anyone that has not given us authorization via the new consent for services. So please check those that are already on the schedule and ensure that their method of contact is set to D for do not contact. For appointment reminders, right now people are making phone calls anywhere from one to three days before an appointment to remind someone to, of their appointment scheduled. Some telehealth reminder calls are actually going out the day of the appointment. So Intergy 
is actually going to be able to do that for you. Um, we are scheduled to go live with Intergy patient messaging the week of August 18th. This will include emails for reminders for appointments as well as text messages or electronic phone calls messages. Um, as I said before, we want to make sure that patients that are already on the schedule who have not signed a new consent for services are set to do not contact. That will ensure that we're not sending message to someone who has not given us authorization to do so. Um, you'll see here on the screen the two new entries on your consent of services. One is method of contact. That is all the methods that they would allow us to contact them. There can be more than one. The next line is the preferred method. That's only one. This is the one that they prefer we use. If they want appointment reminders to come via text, they would select text. But if they do not mind us also sending them emails regarding certain um, information they may need, they may have selected email, text, and mail for methods of contact. But we still need them to se select just one for a preferred method. And we will be um, sending out and uh, hopefully scheduling another training with more information on patient messaging and appointment reminders in the coming weeks. Do we have any questions regarding that information as far as appointments? Nothing's showing up in the chat yet, Laura, but I want to remind everyone you can unmute yourself. If you're on a phone that doesn't have a, a, a mute button, I think you can hit star six and that will unmute you if you'd like to ask your questions. Okay, I believe we can proceed to patient demographics. Um, as with our appointments, there are a few items we are noticing in patient demographics that we want to bring to everyone's attention and ask you to continue to review. Um, a change in probably your process is the social security number field. When we were in success EHS, that was a required field. You could not register a patient without putting something in there. So we used to put all nines in that field to get around that restriction. Intergy does not require you to use a social security number. So we are asking you, if you do not have a verified social security number for your patient, please leave that field blank. If you notice that the SSN entered is all nines, please delete that out of that field. It's causing some um, issues with claim rejections for billing. So we're asking from this point forward, ensure that you have a valid social security number in the patient demographics field for social security or to remove all nines and leave that field blank. Um, the reason we are um, spending this time to talk a little bit about the required fields in our demographics is um, the reason for the accuracy, the need for accuracy in your demographics has a lot to do with um, not only our, our, our health information exchange, which is the ability to exchange information with other providers, but also simply the amount of duplicates we have within our own EHR. It's very hard sometimes to find a patient if there are errors in their demographics. You go to search for that patient, can't find them, register as a new patient. Now we have two records for that patient. This causes some issues, not only matching up the records in our own system, but with other systems and other providers. Due to the fact that the information is not accurate and we have multiple records on one patient, it makes it very difficult for our providers to have the correct information about laboratory work, diagnostic tests, any medications the patient is on, any allergies that patient may have. So inaccurate patient record matching um, adversely affects the care of our patients, the care they receive from us, as well as their privacy, because their information may get matched up with the incorrect person, and we may be inadvertently sharing patient information with someone who is not that person. So it's really important that we work to gather the correct 
um, demographics on our patients to ensure their privacy and their care. Um, when you go to register a patient, please do a partial, partial search on the name. You can do partial searches with just a few of the last name letters. You can do a search for the um, last name or date of birth, social security number if it's known. But we ask that you try several methods to search for that patient before creating a new record because as you know, we already have quite a few duplicates in this system. And because people, especially name changes from uh, marriage, divorce, um, I go by my nickname, but my first name, you know, I may use Nikki, but my first name's Nicole, things like that. So it's really important you kind of try different methods to search for that patient to see if you can locate a record for them before you create them as a new patient. Um, your required fields during quick registration are a date of birth, the language, and the mobile phone number for that person, as well, of course, their first and last name. Um, when you go to do the full registration, you want to capture as much accurate demographic data as possible so that you can um, not have to do that later. Um, it's the same with your quick registration. You want to ensure that if you're capturing a mobile phone, try to make sure that's a correct phone number for them so you don't have to change that later. For full registration, first and last name, sex, gender, identity, sexual orientation, date of birth, marital status, race, ethnicity, the language, the address, preferred phone method, and a corresponding phone entry, a method of contact, and a primary care provider. Those are all required fields. Um, race, language, ethnicity, as well as gender identity, sexual orientation are all required for our Title X reproductive health reporting. Um, that's, um, I've had a question about why do we include some of this information as required fields. A lot of it has to do with not only being able to, as we said, match these patients up when we go to moving records into health exchange, but it's also to allow us to do any federal reporting that we are required to do. Um, from this point forward, we will begin to generate reports on missing demographics data fields, and we're going to be sending those out for corrections on a regular basis. And in your demographics, the fields that are related to your Intergy patient messaging, those are located, as you can see here in the red box on the right-hand side of your demographics screen, the email address. Um, if a patient does not have a valid email address or it's um, blank or has an NA, we need you to change that to the address noemail at la.gov. The way that um, system messaging works in Intergy. If this is an invalid message, it's going to throw an error in the system. So we have created an email address called noemail at la.gov to prevent those errors from stacking up in this system. So when you're reviewing your demographics, if you notice that it's been set to noemail at gmail or um, simply na, we ask that you go in and edit that to add the email address no email at la.gov to ensure that we do not um, create multiple errors in the system once the messaging goes live. You are required to enter at least one phone number and certainly a mobile phone number for patients that are choosing text messaging. A home or mobile number will work for voice messaging. A preferred phone is the phone number that the energy system is going to use first to send these appointment reminders. So if they prefer text, you're going to select their mobile number as a preferred phone. If you've entered their mobile number as a home number and you select preferred phone of uh, mobile, the system's going to prevent you from saving that until you go back and change that. It's going to match up your preferred phone type and the phone entry you have in the record. So if they want to do text, their, text, their phone number has to be answered in the mobile field and preferred phone set to mobile. Laura? Um, pardon me? Uh, real quickly, I just wanted to go back um, and reiterate the importance of the noemail.gov 
no email at la.gov. It has to be at la.gov. Uh, and that is for security reasons because we control that address. If it is a no email at Gmail or any other um, ending, you could potentially be releasing that individual's medical information to someone who is trying to gather information by using that email address. So it must be at la.gov. I just wanted to uh, put it, that little security note in there. I appreciate that, Kenneth. Thank you. Um, in addition, your method of contact, as I said previously when talking about schedules, we would ask you to set that to D, D for do not contact until such time as that patient has signed one of the new consent for services that does contain their method of contact and um, their preferred method for contact. And once they've made those selections and signed one of those new um, consents, then you can update that information in their record. And related to Intergy patient messaging, as I said, August 18th, the week of August 18th is our projected go live for patient messaging. Patient messaging will send an uh, electronic reminder, either text, electronic voice, or an email to remind patients of an upcoming appointment two days before their scheduled appointment. The system will also notify all your no-shows the day after they have missed an appointment. It will send them a notice and let them know they missed an appointment that they had scheduled with us. The one caveat for those no-shows is you have to go in and mark those people on the schedule as no-show. So at the end of the day, be sure you're going to your uh, uh, patient flow in your appointment schedules, checking for any patients that missed their appointment. Make sure you mark them as a no-show so that the system can send those messages to them. So, Laura, you do have a couple of questions that I think you probably answered after they put them in, but let's go over them anyway. One of them said, is text messaging a working option now? Not now. It is not turned on, will be turned on the week of August 18th, and we will certainly notify everyone right before that is actually turned on, but our scheduled go live is the week of August 18th. Next question is, how long should we choose do not contact? until August 18th when the system is ready to contact or until the new consent form is signed with their choice of contact method? Until they have a new consent signed. We're asking you to start looking at the schedules for August 18th forward and set all those patients right now to do not contact. Um, that way the, when the messaging goes live, it's not gonna send those people a message that haven't signed a new consent. Once their person comes in, signs a new consent, and selects their method of contact, then you can update it, that information, and going forward, they will receive notices from the system. Next question is, is the new, con new consent form on the REDCap survey for telehealth appointments? I'm going to have to defer to Tammy. I do not believe we have we press, pushed that out yet for telehealth. I have not. I was waiting on it to be um, final and approved. Once it is, then I can upload that to the telehealth consent. Perfect. Thank you. And the next question is, is the consent in the telehealth package or is it for in-person visits only? Um, as stated, it will be available for telehealth as well once um, it gets final approval and is uploaded to your um, REDCap. And then is this method of contact for appointment reminders only? It is mainly for appointment contacts only. There are other types of messaging. Our plan is to start with appointment reminders. There are other abilities within this system that we're going to take a look at and implement based on our needs and the availability. For right now, method of contact is mostly for appointment reminders and no-show notices. Okay, that's but of course, the 
clerical, I mean, the clinical staff would also be able to view that on the EHR side. And if they need to contact a patient, that's what they will be looking at. They'll look at your methods of contact, what's the preferred one, if they prefer a text or if they prefer a mobile phone, your provider may be using that mobile phone. So there are other uses in our clerical and clinical workflow for that, but for right now, we're looking at it for appointment messages. And then another question is, will we be able to include a message in the message when it is being sent out? No, it will be a standard message, which simply states the date of their appointment, the time of their appointment, and the location of their appointment, reminding them that they have an appointment scheduled two days out. Another question is, will we, will we be getting a new Spanish consent as well? My answer to that is yes. I can't promise it's coming out at exactly the same time. I know they are working on a translation for that. I do not believe we have that as of yet, but yes, they are working on getting a translation for a Spanish consent. Okay, I think we've hit all of the questions that were entered into chat, um, but if you still have another question, you can unmute yourself. And if not, Laura, we can move on to the next section. Hey, um, real quick, um, this is Tammy. I got a question on the chat. So one of the questions I think is good for the whole group. Will the preferred method of contact be used by the clinical um, personnel? And the answer is yes. So um, whenever that new consent is rolled out and the patient starts to sign it, not only will they have all methods that they can be contacted with, but also the preferred. So we start with the preferred, like say if they've got a positive lab, we're going to start with the preferred, but if that doesn't work or the number's been disconnected, we're going to look at all methods to contact to know that, okay, what is my alternate? What, how can I contact this patient to let them know um, what's going on? So that's the extreme importance of getting um, both of those lines done and the difference between it. We're always going to start with preferred, but we need that backup plan of, okay, what is all the methods I can contact you at? So if it doesn't work, we can get them. Okay, a few more chat questions popped up. How does the new system relate to Spanish speaking patients? Um, our appointment messages look at your preferred language in your demographics field. If you have set that person to Spanish, they will actually get their messages in Spanish. Currently, Intergy can only do English and Spanish. It will always do English unless a patient is set to Spanish. And at that point, it will send out Spanish messaging. And then another question is, do we use old Spanish consent until a new one comes out? I'm going to defer to Deborah for that, but I would say yes. Yeah, I don't know what our timeline is on getting the Spanish consent, the new one out. But yeah, I would say use the old one for now. Okay, Laura, that seems to be all in chat for now. All right, excellent. If no one has any other questions, I will turn it over to Dana and Daphne for Energy Base Plans. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, energy Base Plan codes are used to identify the patient's method of payment. So in the system, we've identified certain base plans for insurance billing and then other base plans to identify self-pay patients. Um, and so the best time or the optimum time to add these base plans in the system is at the time of scheduling or registration. And if you do it at the time of scheduling, the, the great thing about it is the system will automatically do um, insurance verification on those insurances that are added at the time of scheduling. And so um, those are the both optimum times to add the correct base plan. Now, when we talk about base plans, what are the base plans that you can add in the system? Um, the base plans we've provided, they're in the office guide. They are, um, those are the only ones that we're supposed to use. The self-pay plans typically have the SP in um, the front of it. Um, and then the rest of the other insurances are, are listed there. And so the base plan that you use, you want to make sure that it corresponds to the insurance that the patient has. So whatever insurance card that the patient presents, you want to look at that base plan to see 
um, the one that match, and that's what you want to add into the system. Um, when you're posting a charge in um, pending charges, you want to make sure that that base plan is there. Um, you just want to make sure that everyone one knows that um, once you post that charge, the system will automatically route that base plan code and change it to the insurance plan code that's needed for billing purposes. Um, and so when you go to run your journal management report, you may not see that insurance base plan there on that, that journal management report. However, once you confirm that you've added that base plan before you post that charge, that's, that's, what's, very, that's what's very important and vital in the process. So um, if a patient presents um, with an insurance card, but we're not going to bill their insurance, you need to in not add the insurance into the system. So if the patient says, um, comes and they present and they, they are underinsured as it relates to vaccines, you don't, you want, they will be private pay and be responsible for the $10 copay for that particular service. Um, for confidential billing as well, and if we're not in that work with the insurance company, then you want to make sure that you leave those as self-pay and not add any insurance for that particular date um, or for that particular service. Um, if we're not in that work with the insurance card and you're adding a patient as self-pay, um, if you would go ahead and send us a copy of that card so we'll know that we have patients presenting um, with, uh, with an insurance that we are not covered with so that we can um, determine um, at a later point if we need to credential with that insurance company. So um, please send that to Dorothy Crotwell uh, at LA.gov. The self-pay base plan will automatically discount a charge based on the program guidelines. So if you put in a reproductive health self-pay and um, the household assessment is activated, then it's going to automatically, at the time of posting that charge, discount that um, those charges based on that household assessment. And again, the immunizations, too, are written down to the $10 based off of that self-pay um, immunization plan code. So please make sure that before you post those pending charges, that you look and you identify that that um, that there is the correct um, self-pay plan identified on that charge. Um, and we'll look at what that looks like a little bit um, later. Um, if a correct self-pay base plan code is not selected, um, the appropriate discount will not apply as stated. And then um, there's more work that needs to happen in order to clean it up. So you have to void that particular charge and then re-enter it and ensure that the, the, um, the plan code is there. And then once you post it again after you void it and ensure that the correct plan code is added, then it'll adjust it at that time. So that's why it's very important for us to get it right the first time so that we don't have a whole lot of rework to do on the, on the, on the back end. So when we look at the special population plan codes, Special population plan codes are only used for reproductive health services. Um, if a patient comes in for immunization, you want to make sure that you always do self-pay immunization. If a patient comes in for TB, always self-pay TB. However, if a patient comes in and they're in a special population category for reproductive health, we need a little bit special, more information, and that's why we created that special population so we can identify which patients may be students, rehab, um, homeless, because those patients are um, charges, um, they don't necessarily need to have proof of income, and that's why they are, um, they have their own code. So when we look at what it looks like in the system, remember when we're adding an insurance or we're activating an insurance, all of the, the that information can be found in the Intergy office um, from office guide. And so um, we have here um, when adding insurance and self-pay plan codes, we want to make sure we're adding the plan code right here in that first section. And then the other thing that's important is to ensure that the member number is correct. Um, and then that number is also duplicated in the eligibility ID. Um, the group and the start date is not necessarily needed in order to bill. However, if, the, if, it is, if that information is found on the insurance card, you definitely can add it. 
for um, activating the insurance and prioritizing the plan codes, this is very important because just because you add the plan code doesn't mean that it has an active number and that we're going to build the insurance company. So you need to ensure that there is a number one indicates the primary um, insurance that we're going to build, and then two indicates um, the secondary insurance that we're going to build, and just make sure that you say that at the end. And we will definitely go over, um, show you that infor information um, in a live demonstration in a second. So um, for the energy based plan codes, um, the other, like, this is where you're going to identify in pending charge section whether or not the correct base plan is added. And, okay, so we want to make sure we check here to make sure that base plan code is here before we post those charges. Because after we post the charge, then we have all that additional work that we have to do to correct it if not. So, um, any questions on energy based plan codes? Reminder you can put it in the chat. Looks like we have one that just popped up. Um, will there be any income accommodations for COVID as WIC does currently? WIC is not asking for income during this time. Um, Tammy, I don't know if you want to answer that question, but I do know that for telemedicine, we are, the patient can um, self-declare. However, for inpatient visits, that when that patient presents in for inpatient visit, um, or, yeah, in, I'm sorry, face-to-face -face visits, we need to ensure that we're um, getting that proof of income. Uh, the next one. Jimmy, you're going to try to answer something else? No, that, that's right. We're, we're waiving it during the COVID for telemedicine, but when we start back in person, we'll go back to the routine Title X regulations. All right, your next question is, if someone comes in for TV services with Medicaid or private insurance, do we put the insurance for that encounter or do we put self-pay? Yes, we add the insurance because we can build the insurance um, for TB. Um, and so you're only going to identify a patient as self-pay if we're not building the insurance company. And yes, we do build insurance companies for TB services. And then she has a follow-up to that. For in-person visits, do we do self-declaration letter if they do not have proof of income? So for in-person visits, um, they would do the self-declaration letter once, and then if they come back and they still don't have proof of insurance for the second time, it would slide up to full pay. So that's for family planning services and for TB services. Um, specifically, we're asking that um, the patient does self-declare, and um, and if they don't come and provide that proof, it's okay because that's not that's not a, a grant requirement for TB. So they can, don't have. Can I just mm -hmm. add into that previous question about Medicaid and insurance being built for TB services? We do what you said was correct, with the exception of employee health TB screenings. Those. Self-pay TB will always be the primary. Neither insurance nor the patient employee will get billed. Thank you for that clarification. You are for health unit employees, right? Health That's for anyone with Office of Public Health being screened for TB, like an annual screening. And if they're positive and they need follow-up medical evaluation and treatment, no payment throughout for TB services for employees, OPH employees, or contracted employees. All right, Dana, that's all you have so far in the chat. If anyone would like to unmute themselves, you can do that now. And if not, Dana, you can move on. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go over insurance eligibility checks. 
This is very vital. Um, one of the major denials that we see, this is the number one denial that we see is um, denials related to eligibility check where the number number is not correct or the insurance company that we're billing is not primary. So um, we just wanted to go over this information to kind of like reduce some of those denials. And so insurance eligibility verifies in real time that a patient has active insurance coverage. Um, insurance coverage can change um, in between visits, and that's why it's very important to ensure that we're verifying insurance at every visit. And, 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 and then ensuring that that base plan code is added um, and is needed in order to check eligibility. The provider must be an authorized clinician when we're going and to check eligibility. And for Medicare, the, the provider, that clinician is always going to be the OPH laboratory. If there is an individual clinician identified in that provider section, it will not run the eligibility. So please make sure um, that you're going in and you're changing that provider to OPH lab in order to uh, run eligibility for Medicare. Each person is responsible for ensuring that they're going in and looking at the details of the insurance eligibility. Even though um, the front screen may show that it's active, that patient may have behavioral health coverage only or may, be ha may have limited services. Um, so we really actually need to go into the details, look to see if the patient definitely has that coverage and is definitely active for medical coverage. Um, even with Medicare and Medicaid, we'll see that another insurance, another MCO may be primary versus that. And that determines what base plan we're going to add into the system. And we do need a copy of the insurance card and into the system. Um, and this will help if there are any denials and we have to go back and do a little bit more research. We can go back, at, you know, if a number is transposed, we can easily identify what that issue is if we have the card. Um, so please make sure that we get a copy of the card and scan it back and forth. And that's important too as well um, since we just moved over into the energy system. I know we had cards in, to, in, in success and some of those card copies didn't come over. And so please make sure you're asking for a copy of that insurance card. Um, so, as I stated earlier, the system will do a automatic or automated eligibility verification and um, if you add that insurance prior to the patient's visit. And right here on this screen is a, is a copy of what it looks like in the scheduling um, piece where it's saying whether it's active or inactive. You can see the A and the I. If there's no response or an error, that will be listed there too, or if it's blank, then you know that it did not check at all. So um, that's just a quick look to see if you have to do a manual check. But no, you always have to go in to look at the details, even though it says active um, on that screen. Okay. And if, as of all processes, they can be found in the um, front office guide. So in the front office guide, we have pictures and processes identified on how you check eligibility. And then, too, when you're viewing the eligibility response, what it looks like. Um, the, they're always going to tell you whether it's their primary pair, if there's a secondary pair involved, they'll identify that and let you know. So right here, this patient seems like they have Medicare. We did a Medicare eligibility check. Medicare told us that Aetna U.S. is primary. So then we would go in and we would remove that Medicare base plan and then add the Aetna plan so that we can build that one. And that's what it looks like. So sometimes the system doesn't run the eligibility check and it'll say um, that it failed or um, something is incorrect and, we, and the system won't um, verify that information. Um, so if that happens, we're asking that you call the insurance number on the back of the car to ensure that the patient has, um, has active coverage. Um, you can add a note into the eligibility section to say that you manually call for verification. 
Um, and also, if it fails, make sure you look troubleshoot. Make sure that it's an active plan. Make sure the provider is correct. Um, and if you still have issues with running the eligibility and you check those things, please submit a help desk ticket and then we can um, look further in, into that, um, the reason why it did not run. So there is a report that um, everyone should have access to um, in order to verify whether, and this is a very good useful tool for supervisors to use um, to ensure that eligibility checks were run on um, the patients that uh, presented that day. So um, if it's, um, if like here it shows the eligibility status, so if, if it's active, again, it's saying that the patient does have active coverage that they found. If there's an error, then it's going to say, you know, what that particular error is, the subscriber ID is, something's wrong with that. Um, it can also show inactive. Here, this eligibility available, that doesn't mean that it had not run. It just meant that it is it's a manual process that, that um, ran the, um, the eligibility. But if you see nothing, then that meant it wasn't run at all. So we'll show you how to um, run this, re this particular report based on location and, and the date. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Let's run through how to add an uh, insurance based plan as well as um, how to um, do an insurance eligibility check. Um, and then maybe, while you're pulling that up, uh, there were a couple of questions that did show up in the chat. Um, one of them is going back to the self-pay TV. And it, the question is, is the self-pay TV code only for employees or for uninsured patients for TB? It's for unsure, uninsured patients for TB as well as employees. So if an, if an employee comes in and they're doing their employee wellness check for TB, we want to make sure we identify them as a self-paid patient because their, um, their, their fundings will automatically discount down to zero like all other TB. We never ask TB patients to pay any funds. The grant dollars that we have pay for, um, for those self-pay um, persons. Um, and so that's, that's the answer to that. And then one more. Oh, so, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I just wanted to reiterate that's for employees as well as self-paid um, patients that present. And then another question uh, for the go live with the new consent, will it still need to be scanned in or will we have a signature pad and the form will be available in Intergy? Intergy does not use any signature pads, no matter brand type, et cetera, connection. There is no ability to use a signature pad with Intergy. So for the current time, yes, it will be the same process as now. You will have to have them sign it and it will have to be scanned into the record. And another question, will we still include the employee's insurance as secondary or leave it off altogether for TB well check? If we're not doing the insurance company, we should not include the insurance um, there at all as, as, as covered. So you would leave it um, with no coverage. And then the next time the patient comes in for TB services outside of that, maybe for vaccines, then you want to add the proper ins insurance um, plan code for that particular service. Uh, another question is, labs only that will be coming in now that had telemed, will those need to have household assessment including income since in telemed not required, but these are in health unit labs? That's waived since it was a part of the um, telemedicine visit. Since it was an extension of the telemedicine visit, they do not have to provide the proof of income for those labs. However, if they come in um, for, um, for in-person visits, then they will have to, to provide that. Okay, and that looks like all your questions in chat for now. Okay, great. So Daphne's going to help um, do that demonstration. So you want to go ahead and get started, Daphne? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to go in to add a plan code and to run an eligibility check 
on some live patients. So Dana, we're gonna go to patient number one. Okay, so for this patient, we see that this patient has Medicare. And we ran, we ran the eligibility on Medicare. When we ran the eligibility on Medicare, we reviewed the eligibility for this patient. So when we look, reviewed the eligibility for this patient, We went, Dana went, go, go down, and we going, we see that the patient has another, has Medicare, but the patient also has an Advantage plan attached to the Medicare. So whenever the patient has Medicare and a Medicare Advantage plan, we will remove the Medicare and add the Advantage plan. So this patient has Aetna. Life, which is Aetna Medicare Freedom Life. So that's the insurance plan that we need to add to the system as primary because that's the patient's advantage plan. We also noticed that the patient had a Medicaid plan that was listed as active, so which was not um, listed as a secondary insurance. So we went and we looked into um, the, Medicaid, um, the Medicaid coverage. And so we did another one just for today to see what it said. And Medicaid, when we ran it, showed that the patient definitely had um, Edna as the primary coverage. And what Medicaid did when we ran MEF, it also gave us the, um, the actual member number for um, that Aetna coverage. And so we thought that that was like the absolute greatest thing, um, especially if the patient only presented with their Medicare card. Um, we were able to look at that and, and, and actually build the insurance company or add it into the system. So Medicaid identified what that insurance policy number was um, here. So when we go and we, we are adding that base plan code into the system, we now have two bits of information that we have to update here. So we're going to remove Medicare as being the, the primary, and we're going to add Aetna Freedom Life as primary, and we're also going to add Medicaid as secondary. Um, also in that eligibility section, we, we identified that the patient not only had Medicaid coverage for Take Charge Plus, which is secondary, but they also had um, mental health coverage. And we just want to show you um, when it says mental health coverage for Healthy Blue, we, we wouldn't want to add Healthy Blue as the insurance coverage. Um, insurance coverage because um, Healthy Boot is only for mental health coverage and not for medical medical coverage. So make sure you pay attention because some of that's one of the issues that um, Greenway told us um, and identified is that we're putting behavioral health um, only code um, plain codes tied to these charges versus medical. Staff, okay. So we're going to go to the coverage tab to the right, and we're going to take Medicare. We're going to remove the Medicare. We're going to find the Aetna Better Health Plan, which is the A-E-T-N-A-F. That's Aetna Medicare Freedom Life. We're going to add that as one, but we need to change that. Um, the claim member ID is not correct, so we need to put the correct member claim ID number in there. Okay. 
And then we're going to also add Medicaid as a secondary. As a secondary. Okay. And so we went ahead before and we added the number number for Medicaid just to run through the checks to make sure everything was okay. So we're going to go in and save it to make the edits to ensure that this member number is correct. We're just going to go in and edit this member number to reflect the correct um to correct to reflect the correct member number. Um, so that's going to add it on her side and then we'll go back and look at it and see. So basically, um, hopefully everyone understands like this, you know, how to read that um, eligibility verification piece of coverage. And, um, and if you don't, if you need a little bit more help, please don't hesitate to give us a call so that we can, you know, walk you through it a little bit more individually if you need that, that help. Um, again, these processes and steps are identified in the office guide, and, um, but when you do a real life um, example, it puts a little bit more meat to it to what you have to do in order to, to make sure that this information is right. So you can't just look at it for face value and add Medicare as primary just because it shows active coverage. We really have to go in and look to see if there is a, a, a Medicare MCO, and if it is identified, you know, do a little bit more research and ask the patient if they didn't present with a card, hey, do you have this card with, your, with the correct member number so I can go ahead and scan it so we can build the right insurance information. Okay, and um, which, Before you switch screens, you did have a quick question. Did you say they have Medicaid, Medicare, and Aetna? So Medicare is the primary, yes. They have Medicare coverage, but remember, the patient can opt for a Medicare MCO, just like a patient that has Medicaid can opt for a healthy Louisiana plan. So when you go into Medicare, Medicare is, the, the patient does have Medicare coverage. However, they opted for a MCO. And so since they opted for MCO, we're going we're gonna to ensure that we add that MCO as the base plan to build out to the correct insurance company. So we wouldn't even add Medicare into this system. So you see, uh, it's carrier Medicare, but the actual plan is the Aetna. Um, this M-E-D-P-A-R is the Medicare um, base plan, which is no longer here as active. So since we didn't have any questions related to that, we're gonna move to um, posting charges. So um, it's very important that we post a charge on the, on, on, at the time of checkout. So once the patient is checked out, um, the process um, that we've identified as best practice is to go ahead and post those charges at that time so that the patient before they walk out will know what their cost share is and we'll be able to ask them to pay for um, part of their services if they're reproductive health or, you know, to take the money for immunizations for their $10 copay if we're not billing insurance. And so the best practice is to ensure that we are pending, um, posting those pending charges before the patient walks out the door. Um, and so when we, I guess the other thing, this is fairly new, when we were trying to understand how we can reconcile um, and to ensure that the charges, the patients that came in for services on that day, we really posted all of those charges. So if you compare your daily schedule to your journal activity or management report, you'll find whether or not you posted those charges related to that patient. And if you have not, I would suggest that you go check pending charges and go ahead and post those charges before you close that day's journal. And then also, in addition to that, if you still don't see it in pending charges, um, communicate with the clinical team for those missing charges. Um, the clinical team, as it relates to best practice, is supposed to um, ensure that the charges are posted and saved from the super bill um, once that patient walks out. And so, um, you know, to work efficiently, we have to ensure that we are posting those charges and that you guys have that charge. So if you don't have that charge, I would um, work with the clinical team to go ahead and post that charge so that we can give the, um, have the proper processes in place. 
Um, and remember, um, you're going to also ensure that the proper base plan is added to that particular um, pending charge section for that charge. Um, and it's very important that that is done. All lab procedure codes and those, the lab procedure codes are those CPT codes that are in between 8,000 um, or 80000 and 8999. Um, and they need a referring provider added in the ailment. So when you ask, well, what, who is the referring provider and why are we adding this particular referring provider for these labs? So in order to build an insurance company, we have to identify who refers that particular lab. And so the provider is listed, and whoever that provider is listed on that charge line, you're going to add them as an as a ailment, if it's an APRN or MD. If it's an RN, then that regional medical director is going to be listed as a supervisor on that charge, and you'll add that supervisor, whoever it is, to that element section. So that's just a nice little hint. So APRNs and MDs will definitely be um, the referring provider in that element. A RN, will, the regional medical director, will be that, um, that referring provider. And that person should be listed as the supervisor on that charge line. Um, the financial center is also formerly known as the financial group in success. Um, this is how we are able to build the correct um, insurance company and use the correct um, MPI number associated with those charges. Um, and then give credit to the actual program um, for those charges. So this is always going to correlate to the appointment type. And so you want to make sure that um, if it's reproductive health, you're using that two, um, TB3, um, CSHS5, Genetics9. Um, and then I think sometimes there's a, some confusion as it relates to CSHS and genetics, but if we're following the appointment type um, and the appointment type is correct, then we should be good. So we're going to go back to the live demonstration just to show you um, how to post those charges and ensure that the insurance information is accurate before you post it. While you're pulling that up, Dana, there was a question about the insurance eligibility. What about running insurance eligibility report to see if it was run? Okay. So the insurance eligibility report is here, you go to report, select, and right here you do a search and you can just do ELI and it's going to come up. It's going to say daily eligibility report and you double click on it. You can either sort by appointment type or patient and you could select the date that you want, preferably today's date, but if you're a supervisor and you want to go check another date to ensure that it was done, you'll do that. Um, you can also view by um, or filter by provider and by location um, to your specific location here. So you'll go and you'll select here for whichever um, clinic you would want to see that information for. If you're looking for region, you know, your region, you're going to select all of the locations for your particular region. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run this just on everything out there today. Um, you guys know we're doing telemedicine, so um, telemedicine is primarily um, here for what's scheduled. And it does show eligibility available. So for your self-pay, you're not going to have any um, eligibility status. It's not going to show you anything because, you know, we can't run eligibility on those. So those will definitely be banked, but if there's an insurance here, you want to make sure that the, the eligibility is available, showing that eligibility was checked or that it's active and inactive. Are there any questions as it relates to this particular report? I apologize for um, missing that. I don't see any other questions for that, but I see the clinic should not use 14 DME formula code. Uh, looks like Dorothy just put that into the chat for everybody. Right. Correct. Okay, so we're going to run through post and pending charges. 
Um, we have a patient that we're going to um, run through real fast. Um, we're going to go to pending charges. So here in insurance and patient information, we'll see that the insurance is not primary. Um, when we go to, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm sorry. I did that a little bit too fast. So when we go here to um, pending charges and we look for this patient, we'll see that there's no insurance identified here. This is blank, no insurance. So we're gonna have to go to patient information in order to add this as primary, at Medicare as, as um, the insurance. So that's and all, I have already took, taken the liberty to verify that the eligibility was done on here and that it was correct. And so now we're going to go and here, click out again and go back in. So now that we've had this primary coverage added, we're gonna go into this particular patient. And now we'll see that Medicare is added as primary for that particular charge. Um, and then we will go in and post that particular charge. So here's where you want to identify that, that information. So if the patient came in and say, we didn't see that, that um, any pending charges for that particular patient um, that was on our schedule, that's when we would go to the clinical team to say, hey, we don't have any charges. Um, can you post those charges so that we can um, post them to the super bill so that we can, um, or save them to the super bill so that we can post them. And Dana, is that also the section where they add the um, provider on the ailment? Yes, this is not. This is not a. Um, yes, yeah, this is not a, um, a eight thousand claim. Um, so, but you would add the ailment in this section. You would do a quick new. You would add your provider um, there, and then you would save it, and then it would be there and you would say post it. Okay, I'm not gonna save this data because this is live um, data. So I just wanted to really show you guys what it looks like, where you verify it, um, how you add it if it's not, and then, um, and then post it. But that is the correct section to add the element if it was a lab code. Um, as most of you are aware, on occasion, there is the need to remove an encounter that was put in either an error or is a duplicate of one that's already been completed. Unlike success, these cannot be deleted. There is a process for voiding encounters in Intergy, and that actually begins with your providers. If you find an encounter that needs to be voided for any reason, you need to notify the provider of that encounter. They are the ones that are going to have to avoid all the information that's entered on that encounter, their labs, their orders, their uh, medications, any of that information, and void the note. Once they have completed voiding everything in that encounter and the note itself, then for a billable encounter that's less than 48 hours old, they're gonna send that information to their regional nurse manager or the appropriate staff member in their region that can void the related charges if there are any. For billable encounters, if the journal is still open, the staff member in your region that has the rights to void charges can handle that. If the billable encounter is older than 48 hours and the journal has been closed, you're going to need to input an LDH service ticket so that the revenue team can have those charges addressed because they, they have been billed out at that point. So they're going to have to work to reverse those charges. 
um, work with the insurance company on that to clear the rest of that up. Until all of that is done, until everything is voided and the charges are cleared, we can't void that encounter on the base side. It's going to continue to show up in your encounter list. Once the charges are cleared, everything's been voided, the notes voided, you can put it in a service ticket for the EHR team and we will void that encounter on the base side, at which time it will finally stop showing up in your encounters list. But none of the voiding of the entire encounter can occur until everything inside that encounter, including any charges, have been voided. It basically has to, as far as the system's concerned, be empty before we can actually void it on the base side of Entergy and remove it from the encounter list. So when you come across any encounter that you see that's either a duplicate, an empty duplicate, opened incorrectly because the person was a no-show, whatever the case may be, you need to notify the provider that is on that encounter. They are the ones that are going to have to void that note and everything attached to it before anything else can happen. So your first step will always be to go to your provider, let them know about the encounter, you know, notify them that it's a duplicate, let them make that decision. We want them to handle all those voids within those encounters because they are the provider. They should know which encounter is correct, which information should be there and should not be there. Um, we don't ever want to make those distinctions. We want to let the provider handle that. They will handle voiding everything within that encounter on the EHR side and at that point um, determine whether it is billable or not and whether the charges have been billed out and that will determine the next path whether it goes to the revenue team first or whether it comes to the EHR team for void on the base side. Okay. Anybody have any questions about that process? No questions in the C. Oh, something happened. Laura. Yes. This is Tamara. Hi, Tamara. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Honey. Great. Now, does this process also apply to voiding for corrections of insurance plans? Voiding as far as charges? If you, yes, if you have a correction where the claim has processed uh -huh. and you get notification back from revenue that the um, either self-pay plan was not entered or the wrong um, base plan was entered and you have to void this be the same process which you need to notify the provider first or just void correct the insurance base plan and move on um, to my knowledge, that would be a different case in where you would, it's not going to change your encounter. Okay. You're going Just to be correcting plan. those insurance plan and those charges on the base side. Okay. And Dana can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that would just affect um, your charges on the base side. It shouldn't affect the actual encounter or the information contained in it. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. So, Laura, we have another question. In the morning, clerical goes in and checks in all telemedicine patients. If a patient is a no-show, we can undo last event, but it won't let us mark it as a no-show sometimes. It also creates a blanking calendar where it looks like the MP has not charted on a patient. Yes. Anytime you check in a patient, the system automatically creates an encounter note. So if you have no-shows, patients, especially in telemedicine, since our process is to check them all in, and they missed it, send a note to your nurse practitioner and let her know that, you know, your 1 o'clock and your 2 o'clock were no-shows, can you void those notes? If she goes in and just simply voids the note, then it's going to allow us to um, no-show those patients. But the note has to be voided first. And uh, hey, this is Tammy. Just to tag on to that just a minute, I find that if the nurse practitioner has documented on that note, no show for appointment, attempted to call, no answer, that's documentation on that note and it won't let you um, avoid it without taking off that documentation. So we've talked to the nurse practitioners about not documenting on the note um, because then the, the, the encounter note can't be voided. 
Thanks, Tammy. All right, then it looks like we can move on to the additional training resources. If you would like to get additional training or still have questions after this training is over, you can, of course, access the video of this training itself in Moodle. We'd suggest you review the training video itself. You can also review your front office clerical user guide. There is a new draft version of that that has been opened, uploaded to the um, clerical module of Moodle. Um, related page numbers for each of those training topics are listed on this slide. There's also a document in your resources in Moodle called How to Get Additional Training, and it's dated for today's date. And that will list these page numbers as well. So you could access that document and just pull it up. It'll give you these page numbers for each of the different sections related to the today's training. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, as far as the VIA trainings that are available, they are, of course, general guidance. They won't be as specific as, for example, our system where you have to select, um, the, for example, the self pay. Uh, insurance plans, but basic step-by-step step information is available in VIA, and um, there is a document on Moodle how to access those VIA training videos and how to do a search for them. You can, of course, self-enroll, and on that same document for clerical additional training, I have listed several of the VIA videos related to today's training that you can do a search for and enroll yourself in and review if you need additional assistance with any of the topics we covered today. Laura, we do have a few more questions popping up in the chat. Uh, one is, if we mark someone as show, but then they end up being a no-show, will it still send the patient a message that they missed their appointment? Only if you go back and no-show them. If you mark them as checked in and you don't back them out and mark them as a no-show, they will not get an um, appointment message that they were a no-show. If we are talking about Intergy patient messaging, the electronic stuff that starts August 18th, yeah, no-show messages that. only work based on a no-show status on the... Um, okay, another question is, the household information page in REDCap does not ask for income. Can that be added? Um, I think that's probably a CYSHCN patient uh, they're talking about, and we do not need household income for CYSHCN. Uh, they do need it for everything else. I will hand things over to Deborah for communication flow. Great, thank you. Next slide. So I mentioned a little bit at the beginning that we had restarted our EMR users work group and this slide this slide will be in Moodle so you'll be able to read all the little gray boxes which are important but this slide really um, tells you if you have a question depending on the type of question you're either going to go to the help desk or you're going to go to a super user so we want to ensure that you know super users are on top of things and and they're involved with you know the manual and revising it and if you can get the information from your super user or the manual, then that's where, you know, it, this um, flow would stop. If, however, you can't, then it moves on to the next piece, which is to contact your regional nurse manager or your ARA or RAM, depending on, you know, which staff it is, um, and then move on from there. And it could potentially go all the way up to the EHR steering committee because everything that we, we're now changing does have to be looked at and approved by folks from the different programs as we, as we did before, including forms. Um, so we will continue with that um, now that we're a little more settled in Intergy, although I know there's still pieces that folks are, are getting used to given how um, up and down we've been with being on the Intergy. So this, this is for your information, just so that we all know who to go to for questions and answers and so that the folks that are getting the questions know who to go to from there and, and, and what the flow back to you all will be. And we'll go over specifics with our colleague, Kenneth. Good afternoon, everybody. So I put together a couple of slides illustrating uh, a couple of possible flows for the way that we would like things to go in terms of you acquiring the necessary help. Uh, on this slide, I've got three examples that you are just going to bypass your super user, 
go straight to creating a help desk ticket. Uh, the first, if your computer won't start or there is some other basic function outside of Entergy, say the printer doesn't turn on or your scanners won't power up or something of that nature, um, go ahead, create a help desk ticket. If you are locked out of your computer or you need a password reset either on getting into your computer or uh, getting into Citrix or Energy, go ahead, create a help desk ticket. We can take care of that for you. If your internet is down or there is a slow connection, um, once again, create a help desk ticket. No need to um, address that with super users. They just, they're not gonna be able to help you with that. So put in a help desk ticket for that. Um, to your right, you can see the three separate ways that OTS recommends that you submit a ticket. Uh, they recommend that you either do it online or via email. However, if you are having uh, connectivity issues, obviously that's not gonna be possible. So you can also utilize one of the two phone numbers. Next slide. Now, there are going to be several instances where you are going to want to consult some form of online resource prior to creating your ticket. <clears throat> For example, patient merges. There is a guide of steps that are required to be completed before you submit a ticket for a patient merge. If you fail to, re to complete those requirements and you submit a ticket before you've done that, we're gonna send you that guide and we're gonna tell you, you have to do these things before we can do the merge. Scanner issues. I know that scanners are still giving a lot of people a lot of problems. Um, this is where I'm going to say, consult that scanner workaround. I created a one page uh, several months ago and if you follow that guide, your scanning will work. If it does not work, that is actually uh, more an issue of something dealing with your session on the Greenway server, and it has to be addressed with Greenway. So we will need you to put in a help desk ticket. But most of the time, 95, 98% of the time, if you consult that workaround and you utilize that process, those scanner issues will be resolved. Uh, requesting a new user. So when you go to onboard someone, you must complete a new user request form. We're getting emails that are just saying, hey, I'd like to add this person or can I please give this person permissions? We can't do anything until we have that new user form. Uh, there are new user request forms for each region. They are found on Moodle along with the other um, workarounds and guides. Next slide. Uh, voiding encounters. We've already covered this uh, with Laura. That guide is going to be on Moodle, so please consult it. However, if for some reason things aren't working even after you've consulted the guide, then you'll go ahead and you'll go to your super user. If the super user is unable to assist, then that's the point at which a help desk ticket would potentially need to be created. And finally, a general catch-all, performing any sort of unlisted job function, because clearly I couldn't lay out every possible mutation of what it is that y'all do. First thing, ask your coworker, because chances are they're gonna give you that, that quick little reminder that you need, oh, I missed this step, or I forgot that, and then you're right back on your way. If they can't help you, consult the appropriate user guide. That's gonna be sort of our mantra. Did you look in your user guide? Because these are going to be living, breathing documents that are updated regularly with all of the newest and most accurate information. So go to Moodle, pull down your user guide. I would strongly recommend that rather than trying to print these things out because they are hefty documents, keep an electronic copy be on your desktop. The benefit to that is that you can actually search that document 
um, by hitting control, hold down the control button and hit F, and it will pop up a box and it says find. And you can type in any words that you might be looking for. Um, <clears throat> and so you can sort of do a keyword search to find those, those particular areas of interest that you might be looking for if you aren't sure where in the document it is. If for some reason you've consulted the user guide, you've not found any help, go to your super user. Super users should be able to assist you with almost everything. If they're not, chances are good that's either going to be a help desk ticket or potentially a change request. Um, but we will be able to determine that after that help desk ticket is put in place. And once again, this slide has um, submitting your ticket online at otssupport.la.gov. You can email that same address um, or you can call either one of the 219-6900 numbers. <clears throat>